it's the blood. If you will take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number 10, and we're continuing our study in this wonderful, awesome book that teaches us about the end times, that tells us really what is going to take place in our world, in our nation. I know you, like me, sometimes just get tired. And you want to say, even so come, Lord Jesus. You know, there's times when we think, God, are you ever going to answer our prayers? Are we ever going to see the end? Will evil ever be destroyed? In this 10th chapter, there's what's called an interlude, a pausing of what has taken place. Last week we saw the wrath of God poured out upon the world, upon the earth, because they have refused to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And in chapter 10, there's this, again, there's this pause. And God is going to finish what He started. You can count on that. Let's stand together and let's read chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up these things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly better. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Father, would you open your word to us this morning? And Father, help us to see your word this morning. Lord, if there's someone here this morning who's never trusted you as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. In verse 7, John writes these words. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, notice this phrase, the mystery of God should be finished. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. The mystery of God finished. You say, well, what is that mystery of God? What's the mystery that God is holding back? 
The mystery is this. The long delay of God taking back His kingdom. The delay of God taking back the kingdom. As we said earlier, we're in an interview here. God's wrath has been poured out and Repentance does not take place upon the earth. But now in this interlude, God is preparing to finish the mystery of God. The delay will be no longer when these things in chapter 10 take place. And God will release the rest of His fury and wrath and anger upon the earth. But in this meantime, the scripture teaches us about what God is doing. Never think that God doesn't know what's going on. Or that God's not aware of evil in our world. He's still on the throne. He's still sovereign. But God has a plan. And no matter what takes place, we're not going to hurry up and make his plan come about. We have to wait until God's timing is ready. Now I want you to see several things this morning because we're introduced to this angel. If you recall, and if you listen closely on Thursday, the devotion I did I mentioned where Jesus said, I'm going to send you another one just like me. And I did that because I wanted to prepare us for this passage this morning. Because that word, another, people have said, well, this is a description of Jesus. Well, I don't think it is. Now, if you say it is, you're probably not wouldn't go wrong, but he says this, another angel. In verse, in chapter 5, remember when the scripture teaches us that a strong angel comes and he, he has this scroll and the scroll is the redemption of the earth where when all this takes place, when all the, the seals are broken, then the redemption of the earth will take place and it says that this strong angel has this scroll. Well, in chapter 10, it says this, and I saw another angel. That word another is the word in the original language, alos, which means someone of the same kind, which means this angel here in chapter 10 is like the one we saw in chapter 5. It can't be Jesus. It's got to be someone else. Now, I want you to notice what the, the scripture says about this angel and, and who he is because it's very important. Because it prepares our heart as God begins to finish this mystery of God. Now, notice, first of all, the arrival of this angel. And I saw another angel a mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. So here is this angel who comes. And then the, the scripture begins to describe the apparel of this angel. Now, if you were to go back in chapter 1, you would find that it is very similar to the way Jesus Christ is described. But notice what it says here. He said this angel who is clothed with a cloud. Now we have, have talked about the fact that Jesus is going to come in a cloud. But the cloud in the Old Testament, remember what it represented? The Shekinah glory of God. Remember when the Israelites were, were coming out of Egypt and they were going to the promised land? What? was the one thing that guided them. It was that cloud. 
hell. It was the Shekinah glory of God. So notice what's happening here. This angel is coming down. He is arriving here on earth. And the scripture begins to describe this angel, first of all, as a cloud. The Shekinah glory of God. Now we would think, well, why would someone be this? Why would someone other than the Lord Jesus Christ be described in that manner? Well, if you go back in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, what you would find is a description of the angel of God before he fell, Lucifer. And you would find this brightness, this glory that this angel had before he fell. So here is this angel from heaven, and he is described, first of all, as with a cloud, the Shekinah glory of God. He is clothed with this cloud, but the scripture also says that there is a rainbow upon his head. And you recall what the rainbow describes and symbolizes. Remember in the Old Testament when God sent the flood? And the flood was upon the earth? And then remember when Noah departed from the ark? And what did they see in the sky? A rainbow. And what did that mean? It was a picture of God's covenant that he would no longer flood the, earth, the world. It was a, a sign of the covenant of God that God was going to redeem this world. And so here in this chapter, you find this, God is beginning to use this angel. God always uses people to bring about the purposes of God in the world. And so here God is using this angel the scripture says he had in his hand a, a little book. Excuse me, let me go back and finish verse 1. Uh, his face was as it were the sun. His feet as pillars of fire. Now we've all already noted earlier that the pillars of fire speak of judgment. His face is like glory, but the, the legs are like the judgment of God. So what's coming? The mystery of God is going to be finished. God is going to use this mighty angel to help in this matter. Now, notice what it says in verse number 2. And he's had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. Now, what was he trying to teach us here? Well, when you go back in Scripture, here's what you find. You find that when God tells someone to put their foot on a piece of land, it speaks of dominion. It speaks of the fact that God is going to conquer that part. And so the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter number 11, what God is going to do. Notice what he, he says in this 24th verse. Every place whereupon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon and the river and the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea, your coast shall be. No man shall be able to stand before the Lord your God. And then in Joshua chapter one, number 1, he teaches the same thing to Joshua. He said every place that the sole of your foot goes, you are going to conquer. So here's this angel, and he places his foot upon the sea and on the land, and it speaks of the fact that God is going to conquer. God's will, God's perfect will, is going to take place on this earth. And so this angel announces that the mystery of God is going to be finished. And this scripture says also in this verse that there is a, a lion that roars and that speaks to the fact of God's judgment upon sin. The scripture says that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So God's perfect will is going to take place. And in this interlude, he is teaching us to be patient. 
to wait on God. That God's perfect will will be done. See, the people of God have always had to wait. Remember in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned? And God made his promises in Genesis 3.15 that Jesus would bruise the head of the serpent. Well, many thought it would be immediately. They thought that throughout the, the Old Testament, that the judgment of God would come, and God's perfect kingdom would come, but it hasn't. The prophets foretold, but it hasn't taken place yet. The disciples believed that it would happen in their lifetime, but it hadn't come yet. Every generation has cried, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, but it hasn't come yet. Does that mean that God is not faithful? Oh, no. It just means that the mystery of God, that God's delay has not been finished yet. It means that God has everything in His hand. And, and just like the Scripture says that as the heart of the King is in the hand of God, He turns it whichever way He desires. In other words, God's got everything in His hands, folks. Don't think for a minute that the world has got us by the hand. God knows everything that's going on. Listen, God knows everything about this COVID-19. It's not a surprise to him. This thing about this coin shortage is not a surprise to him. This vaccine they're wanting to put in us and, and put a tracking thing in us, it is not a secret to God. He knows all these things. And listen, all these things are coming about so that the perfect will of God is going to be done. When we're in this chapter, the church has already been taken out. God has already raptured His church. And now, we're in the midst of the tribulation period. And the wrath of God is being poured out on this world. And literally, billions of people have all Now notice what he says 
He, he tells them in verse number 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And he said, I went and I took it. And notice what he, the angel says to him. He said, Take the book and eat it. You find the same thing where God told Jeremiah the same thing. To take the book and eat it. Now what does that mean? What does it mean to, to, to take this book and eat it? Well, the scripture teaches us in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he will be like a tree planted. It really means transplanted. One that was on dry ground and now is transplanted to the river. Transplanted by the rivers of water. And he's going to be like that evergreen. He's going to have fruit all the time. So what does it mean to, to take the word of God and eat it? Well, have you ever been lonely? Have you ever had something happen to you and you begin to take this word and you begin to read it? And the word of God brings you comfort. Have you ever been so upset and the scripture says that I will dry their tears? There will be no more tears. See, it's the word of God that does that. It's the word of God that brings us salvation. It's the word of God that brings us hope and security and comfort and all those things. It's the word of God in when we receive it, it's sweet. You say, well, what is he talking about becoming bitter? Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians? He, he mentioned this. He said, we are like a savor unto men. Unto some, we're the savior of life. Unto some, we're the savior of death. What he was trying to teach us is this. That the word of God has a different effect on different people. To the saved, it's sweet, amen. amen. It is sweet. I remember a professor in College. We had we got in this discussion about we were talking about the Spirit of God. He said, "No, it ain't sweet. Well, it is for some of us. You know, the the Word of God has that effect when it changes our life, and it's sweet. But what he was saying to those who reject it, it's bitter because what happens?" That same word that brings life to one is going to bring judgment to somebody else. Why? Because they will not receive it. Because they will not allow the word of God to come in their life and transform their life. That's why to some it's sweet, but to others it's bitter. And so what is the the angel tell him, he said, this is the apparatus. This is what you use. It is the word of God. But then he says, here's your assignment. Go preach the word. Go preach the word. I think it was last week that, wasn't it last week, Alan, we had, you know, you guys on Sunday night, it's just, this has just been a long time. <laughs> We were talking and uh, Al 
Alvin and Karen and their family were members of our church about 30 years ago. <laughs> and uh, he, he was one of our deacons. I think he's still a deacon, amen. Anyway, uh, he was telling me about praying for his dad. And uh, prayed for years and years and years. What, six, six months or six weeks before he passed away, got to lead him to the Lord. And I said, well, I want to ask you about somebody else. I said, I, I, I shared with this guy named Buster. I cannot tell you how many times I shared the word. I said, whatever. He said, you got saved. I said, man, you just made my day. I mean, to know that the word of God still has that effect on people's life. Folks, that's what it is about. It's about sharing the Word of God. That this book still changes lives. It is the mystery of God that one day is going to be finished. There's coming a time when you won't be able to share the Word of God anymore. You won't be able to wait anymore. You say, well, why is that? Because in heaven, folks, you can't share anymore. That's why we need to share what God has done. Because one day this mystery of God, this delay of God that God is, is allowing right now, could it be He is waiting for me and you to share the Word of God with someone who does not know Him so that they can come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? See, that's what it's about. That's what this word is designed to do from Genesis to the book of Revelation. It is designed to show a man, woman, boy or girl who we are. That we are lost without Christ. That there's not anything that we can do. We cannot work our way. We cannot buy our way to heaven. It is by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that God has given to us. That has been poured out upon Calvary. The shed blood of the Lord it is by His blood and His blood alone that we are saved. And the message of the cross is that Jesus Christ died, He was buried, He rose again the third day, and He loves people. And God wants to save people. And that's the message that we have. But listen, He said it won't be long. It won't be long. Listen, if you've got someone that you know that's lost, you need to share the gospel with them. They need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ because this book says just as sure as He came the first time, He is coming again the second time. Make no mistake about it. He is coming again. What will you do with Jesus. What will you do with the King of Kings of the Lord of Lords? Has there been a time in your life when you've invited the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life? If you have, praise God. But maybe you've never done that. You say, well, what do I do? Very simple. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need to be saved. I'm turning from my sin. Will you come into my life and save me? And he will. He'll do that. But I want to challenge you if you've done that to do something else. And that's this. To share the word of God. To share what God has done for you. Because there are people who will listen to you that will not listen to me. That's why God has saved you. So that you can share the gospel with those who do not know. We need to share what God has done for us. Because one day this mystery of God is going to be finished. What a day that's going to be. God is not through yet. But one day His perfect will will be done. Let's stand together, please. Father, I thank you today for who you are. Lord, I thank you that you are.
King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That, Father, you have a plan for this world and a plan for each person that's here today. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who's not saved, that, Lord, you speak to them. Because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And Father, I pray for others, Lord, who need to share what has happened in their life. That Lord, they've been saved. And Lord, we need to share it. Father, thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very simply this morning, when I ask you if you've never been saved, today is the day of salvation. And I want to invite you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He wants to save you. And I encourage you, if you've never done that, that you come and let us share with you how to be saved. And if you are saved, I want to challenge you to take what's in your heart and share it with someone else because they need the hope and the courage that you have. Let's sing, please.